range is really kind of the key thing. Uh, but it was really CT, all the advances there that really set the stage for CR and DR. Uh, uh, in 81, Fuji introduced these uh, the special cassettes with the photostimulator phosphor, and that is what kind of uh, got the plates going, and that replaced all the film cassettes uh, because technology just couldn't really support what was going on before with all the data uh, being generated. So ultrasound and nuke med were easy because with those, you know, a lot of the images were taken right off of the screen, what they call, you know, frame grab. So then the image was uh, converted to a digital image, and that's how that worked, okay? Um, it really, in the, um, in, the, in the 80s, we talked about with the VA, this is like the first example of using a network. Uh, we'll talk about this with teleradiography, uh, being able to you know, have multiple places in the hospital being able to do the same thing at the same time, or having another facility being able to do it, or, or you know, getting a consultation. So this is one of the first examples of a network being set up for teleradiography. Um, and then just, I'm not going to go over all the history in that. So you can see, it, you know, it really wasn't that long ago, really, uh, you know, the late 90s, that this all started coming about. Uh, and so a lot of it was pretty, you know, just what we call first generation equipment. So it's really changed quite a bit, all right? Here's the viewing of the x-ray film. So, you know, that's, it used to be that way, it isn't that way, but now we look at monitors. Okay. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the different systems, so the computer skills used to be, you know, back in the 90s and 2000s, uh, it just wasn't that critical that you had to know computers and that. And because of that, there are a lot of historical methods that were still used and not changed due to tradition. Things were rarely reviewed. They weren't willing to change anything. Now, with all the digital, they go ahead. You have to be pretty competent. You have to at least know how to work the computers a little bit broke down all the barriers in the traditional thinking and you know workflow change. I mean, really, a lot of the, the stuff changed from going from uh, film to uh, digital, and now you know they have a lot more technology. So, be even more coming up. So, but you know, we, we've seen the biggest transition already. Uh, you know, here's you know all these different modalities. You know, with using digital. You know, pretty much almost everybody, every department's using that, okay? So we don't really have to spend a lot of time on that. When we take a look at CR versus DR, um, and a lot of this should be kind of a review, so just, you know, uh, just bear me with me. I still have to go over it. So, you know, image capture of CR, you've got the image plate we talked about, put it in a reader, goes to the computer, you can manipulate it. But with DR, it's captured directly sent to the computer. So there's an extra step that's taken away with the DR compared to the CR, okay? It's a little bit more immediate. Uh, with, the, um, with the CR here, <clears throat> so again, it's a cassette-based, you know, the rooms now use an image plate rather than the uh, film screen. Uh, on, uh, it says one of the things to kind of clarify it, um, on page 283 in the 10th edition and 284 in the 11th edition, just a quote, you don't have to get it down, just says, much of the information relevant to CR applies also to DR because CR is just a form of DR. It's okay? all digital, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's just basically you've got CR and then DR is just really kind of based on, mm. that CR is based on DR. So when you talk about <laughs> DR, you kind of talk about CR as it is. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and, you know, obviously the cassettes can be put in the bucket. You can do a tabletop. Uh, we're going to just briefly go over some of the different layers so you have a little bit of an idea of what they do. You know, first of all, you have your protective layer, thin plastic coat that protects the phosphorus. Of course, that's the key one, the phosphor layer right here. So this records that image plate, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, those phosphors uh, record the latent image using the photostimulable uh, phosphors that trap the electrons or create those electron holes. So these phosphors are made from what they call the europium activated barium fluoride family. And this is just for your information. Europium as an activator, that's responsible for the ability to store that, that the, or cause the luminescence, okay? So that's why that's added to it. And it acts as a 200 speed cassette, which if you remember, 400 speed was faster, 200 speed, a little bit slower, but a little bit better detail with that, okay? 
Um, also prevents uh, light, uh, uh, light uh, spread, so it keeps it confined. Then you've got your support layer. Again, it gives some support to that phosphor layer. Your black cellulose acetate, that's just a layer that sends it all, all, that, all the, the signals, the light in a forward direction and that. Uh, and then you've got your uh, backscatter to prevent, prevent the backscatter from occurring and the bar readers also placed there. Backscatter used to be more of an issue with film. Uh, uh, whenever we had a, you know, a lot of technique, uh, we actually, uh, sometimes we had to do like the cross table laterals in the OR. You'd have these, this big patient, you might be using like 500 masks. We'd have to do two exposures. We'd actually have to put a lead, uh, lead apron over the back of the cassette because we'd get so much backscatter. So, you know, that's something that, that helps out with that, okay? Uh, then you've got the plate. We don't really need to, to talk about that too much. All right. So the latent image formation. So when the phosphors are stimulated with the X-ray photon, these electron holes are created, also called F-centers, and they trap the free electrons when they're irradiated. And then the, 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 the plate's exposed to a laser light, which we'll talk about in a second. The electrons are then free, liberated, and they give off light, and that's the signal that we're talking about with that. Um, the, uh, the photostimulable phosphors, when they're trapped, they're trapped in a higher energy state that is unstable. That's why they call it metastable, because they really can't hold that, that, all that energy. So they want it to kind of be released, and that's what the laser light does. It allows that signal, the light, to, uh, uh, to emanate from it, and then it becomes more of a stable uh, phosphor at that point. Um, you, you, you need a port of linkage, linkage like, like wrist to be able to do that, and a patient information scan. So you know all about that. Imaging plates put in the, in the reader. Uh, and then this is how it's basically read. So <clears throat> to release that latent image, once the X-ray uh, uh, photons strike the plate, uh, a focused laser, red laser light, is scanned over the plate in what they call a raster zigzag pattern. And when we, we talk about raster, that comes from the word rake. So think of a rake, you've got its teeth, and each individual one is going over a roll of pixels, so it goes across like that. Then it goes down, and then it goes across like that. So that's why when you see it, it starts going down the screen, and it may go into like, like sometimes boom, 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 or maybe it might be continuous, but that's that raster uh, zigzag pattern that they're talking about. So it causes the electrons, again, because they're in that metastable state, it allows the electrons to come back to the original state by emitting light, and that's gonna be the signal of that, okay? And then the light's picked up by the photo uh, multiplier tube and converted into the electrical signal. So let's take a look at it actually as it is. So you have the x-rays, striking the photostimulable plate creates this latent image. Remember, latent means it's invisible. It's there, you just can't see it. Then you've got the red light that goes in that raster zigzag pattern, kind of moving down, and that allows the image to actually appear here. Then it goes through the analog digital converter, and now you actually have your digital image, okay? So that's kind of uh, in a nutshell as to what happens with that. Uh, because energy stored in the imaging plate dissipates over time, this is not usually a, a problem with us, is that imaging plates need to be read quickly and that there's a major loss after eight hours. With film, uh, you know, if you made an exposure, you could put that back in the bin and you know, expose it, you know, you know a, a couple weeks later. Uh, that's sometimes how we had double exposures, that people forgot to use it, put it back in there, and then uh, next week, then it was like double exposed film. Uh, and that image always stayed there. So, but these will, you know, it has a limited time, but you're developing the stuff pretty quick. So it doesn't really uh, um, have a big effect with that, okay? Also, I want to go back and talk about something else. Uh, and this is just more for information. One of the things I always struggle with is, you know, Bouchon would mention certain terms or you'll be tested over certain terms. I don't know if you heard of when it says something is sampled and quantization. Have you ever heard those terms? So basically, the best I can come up with here is when it says that something is sampled, they're just talking about the time between the samples. And when they talk about quantization, they just mean the value of each sample. 
And I found that that's almost all you really need to an answer any questions. Uh, but occasionally they'll throw those things in. So uh, that's kind of more beyond what we're talking about here, but I just kind of wanted to, to cover that. All right, so we talked about that here. The electronic signal is converted to you know, digital format when it's manipulated. And very importantly, that IP plate has to be erased, okay? So it uses a bright white light inside the reader and then it's reloaded. So that's an important uh, concept behind that, the bright white light. Uh, the workstations are used and sent to a pack, so you know about that. Whole process takes you know, about 20 seconds. Plates can be used you know, 10,000 times. Uh, once exposed, it has to avoid light so that it doesn't stimulate those phosphors. And it's kind of the same thing with film. One of the things that we learned about with film is that you can have an unexposed film and an exposed film. That exposed film was like eight times more sensitive to all kinds of things, whether it was your thumb mark or you know exposure to scatter. So once that is exposed, you really have to keep it away so it doesn't get stimulated again. On the back of the cassette, there's a label indicating the speed, which is really brightness. That's where they're talking about that, okay? Um, so now in terms of the monitors, let's talk about this for a minute. So the viewing of the images can be done either on the old cathode ray tubes. Those are like the old TV, the thick TVs. That's the cathode ray tube, okay? And they work fine, all right? Now everyone's kind of used to using the flat panel detectors, the active matrix liquid, liquid crystal display. So the flat panel detector certainly is better than the cathode ray tube and it has better spatial resolution because it has more pixels, higher uh, metapixel display, and also has better contrast resolution because it has better grayscale definition, the, you know, the dynamic range is wider, and noise is less, so you can see the image better, okay? But one of the key things to remember here is a flat panel detector, that's preferred, but it's not necessary. You can get by with that cathode ray too. So when you make up, a, you know, develop, design a room, you don't have to have the thin, the, the, you know, the thin panel uh, detector. The cathode ray tube will still work fine, okay? And this is kind of the sad part of, of the whole thing, the whole gamut of, of, of you know, um, digital imaging. Really, the displays are like the weakest link in the whole thing. Uh, uh, maybe not for the radiologist, those uh, monitors I heard like are thirty or $40,000. So we see something on the screen, it's like, oh, it doesn't look that great, but the radiologists can see more. But you also have to remember, one of the things that's always going to restrict digital is our eyes. Our eyes only can pick up like the 30 shades of gray. So it can produce, you know, that, what, the range of like 63,000, but we can only see that narrow range. So no matter how much we improve things in terms of resolution or grayscale, our eyes only pick up so much. So it's only going to improve so much. But really, the displays are kind of like the weakest link of the whole chain. That's what's always going to prevent it from. It's probably doing more than we can see, but the digital the displays are really kind of holding things back a little bit. Okay, but you don't need the flat panel. It's great, but you can certainly work with the cathode ray too. All right, um, this is stuff that you're familiar with, but I just want to go over. So with your exposure indicators, you know, this is an indicator of, you know, of, of light being given off. So you could, first one we'll talk about is the S number or the sensitivity. So Fuji uses the S number as the exposure indicator and the scale is inversely related to exposure density. So a high S number actually represents underexposure where a low S number actually indicates overexposure. So when you change by 200 the exposure factor in that, it changes it by a factor of two. So if you go ahead and add 200 to that S number, it's basically cutting the exposure in half. Where if you add, or if you subtract 200 from it, it's actually doubling the exposure. So 200 is kind of like that, that cutoff point. So that's with the S number as an exposure indicator. The other exposure indicator with Kodak that uses an exposure index, okay? And in this case, it's directly proportional to exposure density. So if you have a high exposure index, it means it has uh, overexposure. If you have a low exposure index, 
it's underexposure. Now the change needs to be 300, bless you, needs to be 300 to result in the change of a factor by two. So if you add 300 to the exposure index, that's the equivalent of doubling it. If you subtract 300, that's the equivalent of halving it. Well, it's interesting, sometimes it's something that's so far out there, they actually have to go through a couple of steps. It's not like it's doubled, it's like four times as much. So that was kind of interesting too. Uh, uh, you know, where you have to, it's not just one, it's not just a little bit overexposure under, it's quite a bit, okay? All right, so those are the two different types of exposure indexes, indicators. Uh, and then, of course, checking it will uh, indicate, you know, uh, whether the images were, you know, using the least possible dose. We'll talk about uh, dose coming up. That's not, it was a goal, but it's not actually practiced all the time. Here are some numbers. <laughs> I don't want to go over that. I'm not going to ask you those. So you have just a, a little bit of an idea what the S numbers are, okay? All right. With DR, I hope I'm not going too fast. Mm -hmm. no. Okay, all right. I know that, you know, I don't want to be like, oh. This is torture, okay. So with DR, of course, it's a cassette-less system, uses an X-ray absorber material coupled with a flat panel detector, but more importantly, that charge coupled device, the CCD. So you're gonna see that quite a bit. That helps form the image. So there's your unit, we don't have to talk about that. We're gonna talk about here, we're gonna divide up DR into two categories. You have your indirect capture and your direct capture. And the indirect capture just adds one step more than the direct. So with indirect capture, it absorbs the x-rays after it goes through the patient's body and converts that into light. And then the light is detected by the, the CCD or the thin film transistor, and that's converted into the electrical signal. So it's x-ray to light to the electrical signal in the sense of the computer. Now with direct capture, it just sends that, in, that the, the x-ray that goes through the patient directly into the electrical signal. So it skips the, the light stage, okay? And then it sends that again to the computer. So let's take a look at these. I'll kind of go back between this and the next slide. So the exit beam radiation, after it goes through the patient, first reacts to or first it interacts with the cesium iodine phosphor uh, that's coded over an, 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 a matrix. So you've got the x-ray photons that strikes the cesium iodide, all right? Then that gives off light by the, the cesium iodine phosphors, and that's converted to electrical signal using amorphous silicon, okay? So once a photon strikes this, the cesium iodine it gives off light, then it's converted by amorphous silicon into electrons or an electrical signal. Okay, and then that signal is stored and then it's presented on the monitor with indirect capture, lower dose, a lower dose than direct capture occurs, okay? So that's, that's basically your indirect capture, all right? Now, let's talk about the direct capture here. So you've got the exit beam going through the patient, but this interacts directly with the amorphous cilium, uh, selenium, okay? Um, when we talk about, uh, oh, I'm sorry, let me go back uh, to uh, this here. Uh, this was on page 298 and 299 in the 10th edition, and pages 299 and 300 in the 11th edition. Okay, sorry, I want to skip over that. Uh, let's go back to this here. Okay, so you got the exit beam, you know, uh, you know, going through the patient, interacting directly with the amorphous selenium, and that creates the electron hole pairs, which is basically the signal, and then again, that's stored in the thin film transistors. The advantage is there's no spreading of light, and we'll talk about that with spatial resolution when we go over uh, uh, resolution coming up, okay? So you have the X-ray that's striking this matrix of pixels here, okay? And it uses the, uh, uh, the amorphous selenium. Now, the amorphous, when you talk about amorphous, just some background information, that just means uncertain shape. That's all it means, I don't know why they don't call it that. Uh, but the image is acquired as a matrix of pixels, and then it's converted from analog to digital into the digital image, okay? So that's with your direct capture. And that is on page 299 and 300 in the 10th edition, 
and pages 300 to 301 in the 11th edition. All right. So with both systems, you know, the latent image is stored, in, like I said, that thin film transistor. We'll talk about it a little bit later when we go over resolution, but spatial resolution is limited, as you know, by pixel size, okay? Uh, so with image processing, I'm not gonna go over this too much. You know, you got your conventional dumb chemicals, we don't do that anymore. CR and DR, processing in a computer. Uh, DR, the computer's located near the console. I don't really need to go over a whole lot of that. Here's just a comparison of some materials that we talked about. I'm gonna kind of skip over that if you're okay with that. So when we talk about CR versus DR, CR is a system where the image, again, is first captured in analog and then sampled. We talked about that sampling into the digital. And then the DR is where the image is acquired immediately as a matrix of pixels, okay? So that's just a little bit of a review. All right, let's go ahead and talk about the matrix, all right? So the digital radiographic image is formed as electronic image displayed as a grid called the matrix. And that image is laid out in rows and columns and that's your image matrix. And within the, uh, each of the cells, those are your picture elements or your pixels, okay? So each cell has its own bright, a number given to indicate its own brightness, and more importantly, it has its own dynamic range. So that's called the grayscale range or the number of shades of gray. And this is really kind of the key thing. This is what gives that such flexibility of being able to select and give you, you know, again, that contrast resolution. Uh, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second here, all right? So, as you know, the more pixels there are, the greater the image resolution, okay? So each pi pixel consists of bits of information and the number of bits <coughs> per pixel that defines that shade of gray for each pixel is known as bit depth, okay? And the bit depth is, is indicated as an exponent. So if a pixel has a bit depth of eight, that means it's two to the eighth, okay, which is 256 shades of gray. So some of the CR systems have a bit depth of 10 or 12, that means 10, that means two to the 10th or two to the 12th, okay? And then uh, the gray, of course, the greater the pixel depth, the greater the contrast uh, resolution here, okay? So um, again, so two to the 12 is going to represent 4,096. That's where they get that number, all right? Let's go ahead, um, and again, the greater the, the, the image matrix size, the greater the spatial resolution. Let's look at this here that I put on the board. So let's say that you have a matrix of 2048 by 2048. You have another matrix of 1024 by 1024. Which is the one that's going to have the best spatial resolution? 2048. The big one, yeah. Always the top one. So just look for the biggest numbers. That's always going to give you your best spatial resolution. And just think of it as kind of like you're restricted to a square. And in this square here, you only have 1,024. So they're bigger, right? If you fit 2,048 in that, they've got to be even smaller. And the smaller, the you know, again, the smaller, the more pixels, the greater the resolution. So always look for the highest number possible, whatever combination it is. It may not be 2048 by 2048, the two numbers may be different, but you can just look at the combination of that, of the, the sum of that product. That's the one that's gonna have your greatest resolution, okay? Let's go on to the next one here. So this here is actually table 17-2 in the book. It's on page 311 in the 10th edition and 312 in the uh, 11th edition. So we talked about the wide dynamic range. Remember the 4096? There you go, okay? So you're kind of limited to that here. So that's gonna represent two to the 12. That's where they're getting that. So wherever you fit, that's going to give you your greatest resolution right there, okay? All right, now let's go ahead and we'll go on to the next one here. So this is kind of just a summary here where you have a wide, and what they're saying wide, you're talking about here, a wide dynamic range. We have a wide dynamic range. You have many shades of gray, okay? Which means you have a wide latitude. Uh, you have better contrast resolution. 
but overall it's considered low contrast because you know there, again whenever you think of the word contrast always think of the word differences okay differences between adjacent densities so if you have a lot of shades of gray there's not much difference between each adjacent one that's why it's low contrast okay as opposed to narrow or a small dynamic range you have fewer shades of gray it's going from black to white very quickly narrow latitude that's considered high contrast high differences between each adjacent density does that make sense okay all right uh, let's go ahead and talk about this I'll, I'll go back into this a little bit so when we talk about spatial resolution that's just the amount of detail that's present or visible on any image and a number of things affect that phosphor layer thickness will check will affect that pixel size is also going to affect it so the thinner the phosphor layer um, uh, the thinner the phosphor layer the higher the resolution so let me kind of go back and talk a little bit about this so phosphor layer thickness in digital it's kind of similar to film screen mm -hmm. phosphors so the fall the small phosphor size is going to produce less overlap of light from each adjacent phosphor. If you have a thin phosphor layer, it also produces less overlap of light from each adjacent phosphor. So this in turn, because there's less light being focused on the next adjacent phosphor, you have less overlap or less penumbra, which is also geometric unsharpness that you're talking about. So the less overlap you have, it's a small, a thinner layer, you don't have as much overlap. It doesn't have a lot, a lot of room to project down into the next phosphor in that. So if it's a small phosphor size or a thin phosphor layer, you're gonna have less penumbra or less geometric unsharpness, okay? All right, um, this is always kind of interesting. I'm so fascinated by this. In CR, the resolution is about two and a half to five line pairs per millimeter. That's how you measure spatial resolution. But film screen is eight line pairs. So all this advanced technology, it's actually less resolution, okay? But it doesn't appear to be less resolution, okay? And the reason is because of this dynamic range, that grayscale is so wide that the difference in resolution is really hard to see. The tissue densities give it the appearance of more detail but actually there's more detail in film okay but because of the wide dynamic range it appears to be very kind of more grainy more detail in that so it appears that way but it's, your eyes are kind of fooling you in that okay all right let's go on here so in terms of technical factors you know you know a lot of the same whether you see cassettes or not cassettes of course, only one exposure at a time on the image receptor. Collimation, very important on this, as you know, because DR is much more sensitive to scatter than film was, okay? One of the things we used to keep film cassettes in the room when we had a R and F room, we'd keep them off in the corner, it wasn't a big deal. Now, that's one of the big things is if you have a cassette in the room, you gotta get that out of there before you take the next picture because it can pick up, it can stimulate, especially if it's been exposed, it can really pick up all those signals on that, okay? But collimation is also very critical with this. And the problem is when you wanna, you know, because you wanna collimate, you wanna remove scatter, you might use grids to clean things up, okay? But one of the problems of using grids is that you can get what they call a moray pattern, okay? And the moray pattern is a strange pattern that looks like grid lines, okay? And it appears because you're going to resize that image onto the display and it kind of mags it up. And then all of a sudden you see all those lines here. But that's the moray pattern, okay? All right. Uh, let's see. Let's go on to the next one here. Noise, okay? So noise, they just define that as random disturbance that obscures and reduces clarity, okay? So as you know, if you don't have enough mass, if it's insufficient mass, too few photons are striking it, so that'll result in a, in, a, in a lack of phosphor stimulation. So the image is now gonna be grainy, or as you know, quantum model or noise, okay? Um, electronic noise, they just define this basically 
as a process of converting the x-rays to digital, a digital signal. So you want, the more time it is allowed for that signal to convert, the better the uh, pixel values will be. That's all they're referring to on, on that. Um, this is on page, uh, and, and you don't, you don't uh, this is in the book, on page 291 in the 10th edition and page 292 in the 11th. And it's really concise. And this helped me with my studies. It says, the principal source of noise on either a film screen or a CR system is scatter radiation. Okay, so the idea is that, you know, if you're going to take two images on one, you've got to mask it off. You get that cassette out of the room. Okay, you're going to try to sometimes don't use more KV than you need. It's going to cause more scatter. So anything you can do to reduce scatter, that's going to help reduce noise. Okay? All right. Uh, other technical factors using small imaging plate, you know, that helps out. Collimation, again, should be used to reduce patient care, uh, patient dose. Uh, and then side markers, of course, should be used. You know about that. Let's talk about some of the image post-processing that we can do or things that maybe we should not do, okay? So the first one, I really want you to pay attention on this one. It's kind of interesting. Is they have spatial frequency resolution or decal. So a number of facilities will not allow the text to manipulate that because what that does <laughs> is it restricts the radiologist from being able to manipulate it. So the radiologists want to do it, so a lot of times it's best you don't even touch that spatial frequency resolution. You don't touch the detail on that, okay? Now, edge enhancement, this is used a lot of times with a C-arm. Have you seen that with a C-arm? Uh, basically, what happens is after the signal is obtained, the signals are averaged to shorten the process. So when fewer pixels are in the area, uh, the small area gives it greater enhancement. Basically, what they're doing here is Edge enhancement is a, you can call it up, you can hit a button on the, on the C-arm, especially with the, uh, the OEC. It gives it greater detail to extremity fractures that reside along the edge of a bone. So if you're doing like a hand or a wrist, and you want to see that fracture along it, you can go ahead and hit edge enhancement. It'll make it more grainy, but you're going to be able to see that fine detail. That's what they mean by edge enhancement. I kind of think of it like almost like edge of a, of a bone. You could really see that detail in that, okay? So that's all they're talking about. They're factor fewer uh, pixels in that and give it greater enhancement, okay? So that's something that you can certainly do and that helps. Uh, smoothing is kind of just the opposite of that where you're averaging each pixels uh, to uh, remove the high frequency noise. So it's a reduction in noise uh, but it's also a reduction in contrast, okay? So it kind of goes one way and the other, okay? Windowing and leveling, that's something you'll see in CAT scan. Where windowing basically is your brightness, how it goes from light to dark. Leveling is your contrast, ratio of black to white, okay? And then shuttering, I want to talk about this a little bit here. This gets a little confusing. So here you have automatic shuttering that's used to black out the white collimation borders, what, they, what you're trying to do is reducing veiling glare, okay? Also known as white light blindness. So let me kind of talk about this. So in the book, it mentions that veiling glare in the imagery, in, in the image intensifier, you might have remembered, it says it's due to internal scatter from light photons, photoelectrons, x-ray photons, and it lowers the contrast resolution, just like noise lowers the contrast resolution, okay? So when you think of this white light blindness, think about first thing in the morning, you open up the shutters and all of a sudden, ooh, that light, it hits you, okay? What it's really trying to do is, you've got the image, and of course around the borders, you know, uh, right outside the, the skin, it's black, and then all of a sudden it hits the white collimation borders and it kind of blinds the, the, the machine. So basically what it's trying to do is black out all of the white border so it transitions from the black, you know, out, right outside the skin to a black border. It's not like opening up the blinds like, oh, it's all bright, okay? That's why at night it's not a problem. Does that make sense about the white light blindness? To me, that's kind of like my way of understanding it. Okay, now let's talk about the next one here. Uh, image orientation, I don't need to go over that. You know how that works. Let's talk about image stitching because a number of the facilities I know have this equipment. 
specialized software that will stitch together multiple images when the anatomy is too large. So what's an example of a procedure that you're going to do, a particular view, that you're going to use image stitching? You should know this. Scoliosis. Scoliosis, Scoliosis exactly. So does everyone have that? I know at St. Jude they have it. I've seen it. Does everyone have something that does stitching? No. Good. No? No. Who said no? I'm sorry. Whittier. Whittier, yeah. See, that's... Yeah, I, did, I thought there were a few places that didn't have that, so yeah. Do they do scolies? Um, I've never seen one. Yeah. Their version of scoli is just a chest and an abdomen. Okay, and they just kind of, the radiologists would kind of piece it together. Yeah. Yeah, in my last job, we actually had three folding film that actually opened up and a fake scoli cassette, which was heavier than you can imagine. But yeah, this is the best thing, so anyways. But they will have that at all facilities at some point. And of course, annotation, which doesn't replace markers, and then magnification using that little magnifying glass that will zoom over that. So you know about that. I don't have to tell you about that. Let's just talk real briefly about some of the advantages of CR and DR. There's two uh, slides on this. So obviously, you know, it can be used many times. You know, it can be CR can be used as existing equipment. The image plate doesn't have to be light tight. Uh, you know, there's no name markers, so you know it gives it more area that you don't have to worry about to read quickly. Uh, you can manipulate everything. You can zoom, edge, enhance, and that repeats or reduce. No processing, no uh, environmental effects. Uh, lower exposure technique is possible. We'll talk about this in a second. Due to increased phosphorus sensitivity, it's not always the case. Okay, uh, it, the DR eliminates cassette handling. Uh, there's no you know hard copy storage. Uh, and one thing we'll talk about just in a little bit uses tailor radiography. So you can send those images to multiple workstations in the hospital, outside the hospital with a consulting doctor, to the radiologist at home, to India, wherever they're reading it. So that's allowing it. Uh, transfer, copying of images, again, simultaneous viewing of that. Uh, so now, disadvantages okay, possible overexposure of patients. Called the creep. Have you heard of the creep? Dose creep. Okay, yeah, they're not talking about me, they're talking about dose creep, okay? So basically, they thought over time, oh, we'll, you know, these photostimulable phosphors are more sensitive, we'll be able to reduce your dose. Well, they found out in practice that if you're gonna do anything, better hit them with more than hit them with less. So I noticed I worked at a facility and I would try to get within that nice range. <laughs> I work with another guy, and he would always end up way higher than me. And we shoot him hot. Are there images, huh? Shoot him hot. Yeah, shoot him hot. Well, the problem is it's higher patient dose, okay? And you got to be careful because, obviously, if you underexpose it, you're now going to have noise, loss of detail, you know, of course, centering. Centering was always important anyway, but now you're doing sampling, so you got to make sure that you're centering. You've got, you don't want to over-collimate. You don't want to under-collimate, okay? So, and usually you're not taking the same uh, two images on the same one, so you don't need to let basking in that. Um, and again, spatial resolution is a little bit decreased compared at least to film in that, okay? Uh, with PAC systems, we don't have to go over the detail. You all know about PACs, okay? Obviously, a network of computers. But one of the things that you might not read about as much is what they call DICOM. And that's the communication system between the different computers. So PACs can accept any image that's in a DICOM uh, format, you know, digital imaging of, and communication uh, in medicine, okay? So it's got to set up, be set up for that. Um, I don't think I need to go over all the stuff on, on PACs. You know all that. Uh, I think we can kind of skip over.